going to talk about uh, some rhythmic ideas that are some of his fundamental things to think about uh, as it pertains to the vibraphone. I find myself at the conservatory uh, uh, with students most frequently talking about time and rhythm. So Ted suggested that I talk just uh, quickly about that. Um, OK, let's start basic. What is rhythm? That's a tough one. Uh, I saw an interview with the great Elvin Jones, and he was asked by the interviewer about uh, how he's the great creator father of polyrhythms. And he asked him to say what it was. And Elvin said, well, poly means many, and rhythm means, it means many rhythms. So I thought that's pretty good. Um, he painted himself right into a corner, didn't have an answer. Um, but, and in Bob Becker's latest book that I guess came out a year ago or something like that, he, uh, he defined rhythm as the perception of, uh, I've got it here. Uh, the perceived organization of elements in time. And then he put a disclaimer on it and said, for the purposes of this book. But that's a, good, that's a good thing for us to use today, too. The perceived organization of elements in time. All right. Um, it's inherent. We, as people, um, we have very common things that we uh, feel when we play it or hear it or our, our human condition gives us this shared uh, way of, of feeling time. As a result, uh, I find, and I think uh, teachers, anybody who's taught a lot, also finds that we also uh, deal with the same problems when we are dealing with certain organization of elements in time. And so it's very common for me to hear the same problems uh, from student to student. Okay, so. Let me get into this. I, I, I'm getting away from my thing. So, um, not long ago, I started taping myself and putting it against the metronome. So, tape without the metronome, and then, and then play the metronome against the click. And uh, of course, I found that uh, I wasn't I wasn't metronomically perfect. Um, I also found that I rushed everything. I think once once we all achieve a certain amount of technique, we want to use it. We don't jump in a Corvette and go 25. You know, once you've got it, you want to, you want to, you want to go, you know? So, but that's, that doesn't help you to, for other people to hear that and say, I could play with that, which is what I found most, a lot of committee members when I'm sitting in on auditions, that's the way they gauge. Oh, I can play with that. Yeah, and jazz players too, I can play with that. So that's, that's where you're going. Uh, at any rate, with enough reps, I got to where I could pretty much lay something out and then it would be fine on the click. So then I turn my click off and listen to it again and realize, okay, well, that doesn't sound human and that sounds completely controlled. And now I've got to figure out how to make this attractive again now that I've been able to do that. So what I would start to do, which anyone would start to do, is start to manipulate. But at least I'm manipulating the rhythm from a spot where it's control manipulation instead of accidental manipulation. You know, I know, I know what I'm trying to do with it instead of playing it without any knowledge. I'm manipulating the rhythm, all right, just not in a very good way. So, what I, want to, what I want to talk about is, I, I want to take two uh, uh, vibraphone uh, passages uh, from the orchestra. Um, one of them is West Side Story, it's a fugue, it's probably the most famous, famous one. And it's notated, it's a jazz notation, but Bernstein uh, in the symphonic dances, for whatever reason, chose to notate half of the jazz part in 6-8, uh, and half of it in more like a big band style, dotted 8 sixteenths, you know, which is also common uh, jazz notation. But, uh, for orchestra, you know, sorry, string players, they're not spending a lot of time at home reading big band charts and listening to Kind of Blue, you know, they're just not. So um, they deal much, much better with 6 eight than they deal with dotted A 6 eighths because it's kind of in the field. So at any rate, to play this thing in 6 eight, Awful, right? Everybody knows it doesn't go that way. So what I hear uh, most, very frequently, is, is guys coming in and playing triplets. But it's still too bouncy. So I'll say, okay, let's do this. Play even eight notes. Okay, now relax that eighth note just a little bit. Play the laziest triplet you can possibly play. I mean, I'm pretty close to eighth notes there, but that's starting to swing now. All right, then the next thing I would say is left hand heavy, which by the way is, I say it awful lot. 
Um, most of the time, uh, most of us are right-handed. Most of the time, our, we're going to lead our stickings with our right hand. That means strong notes are going to be in your right hand. That means they're the ones and the ands. I'm going to hear those. I'm already going to hear those. It's the ones in between, the E's and the O's, I'm not going to hear. So if you can bring out your left hand a little bit even stronger than your right, to me, it fills out that sound and, and makes you sound completely controlled. So at any rate, now I'm going to get, get rid of some right. starts to swing you know a little bit more and okay so um by the way you know i, I was kind of thinking about that too the, the the off using your left hand there so you think about how a sax player is going to play a, a line like that you gotta go bum, 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 bum. they actually are kind of leaning heavy on the off beats which you know we as percussionists we don't necessarily put that together but i think that's another reason why you like the left hand heavy on that because it kind of swings the way a, a wind player sax player you know, might play that. Yeah. Trump player. And uh, so that's, that's an example, probably the best example I can think of of taking a, a rhythm thing and, and even taking the rhythm that we all know is supposed to be and manipulating it to where it's more attractive to your listener. Now we've got to, we've got to talk about...